This is the second chapter in the videos on predictive control. The focus here is on GPC. So what then is generalised predictive control or GPC? This was first proposed by somebody called Professor Clark and his co-workers in the 80s and at the time it drew together lots of the existing thinking in algorithms in the area of predictive control and tried to put them into a single algorithm. Conceptually it was equivalent to dynamic matrix control which was also um, around at the time and becoming quite popular in industry. In fact it's probably still the most commonly used algorithm within industry. Now, GPC or DMC have many theoretical weaknesses, but, and this is important, for most cases avoiding these is straightforward and that's why they've been so successfully used in industry. Now this chapter is not going to look at the theoretical weaknesses, it's simply going to say what is GPC stroke DMC and how do I do it? So the main aim is to develop the core components within a GPC or DMC algorithm and show how these are used to derive a control law. Later chapters are going to look at analysis, tuning, how to avoid poor performance and so on. We'll give some indications of the problems and scenarios where GPC or DMC perhaps have problems and in particular we're going to give a very brief look at loop sensitivity because that's a key issue. We'll introduce some of the MATLAB code available for implementing GPC. This code is going to be available on the Google sites. We're not going to look at the constraints. They are covered in a later chapter. So what assumptions are we going to make? The first set of videos, or chapter one if you like, in this series, set out the foundations of a typical algorithm, and we're going to need those foundations. So we said you needed unbiased predictions, and for now, we're using open loop predictions and we gave an example for state space models based upon deviation variables. We also need an unbiased cost and so we had an example which maybe had tracking errors or the distance of the input from the steady state which is like a deviation variable or changes in the input. Now this set of videos is going to look at a combination of these two components and basically say if we combine these two together, that is unbiased predictions and an unbiased cost, what control law do we end up with and can we do some analysis on this control law? Notation then. Viewers are reminded of the arrow notation that was given in the early uh, videos, chapter one, and the arrow notation basically gives vectors of vectors where a right arrow tells you you're looking forward in time, so it's prediction, and the left arrow tells you looking backwards in time, so it's past data. So here's some examples just to remind you. I've got y right arrow underscore k plus 1, so that tells you I'm starting my prediction at sample k plus 1 and I'm going forward in time. Now, the specific notation, the arrow, doesn't tell you how far forward you go, it just tells you you're going forward. And you'll notice here we've got a left arrow notation, which you'll see says you're going backwards in time. So you're picking up past data. And we've got a forward arrow notation over here for delta u future. And you notice because we had the subscript k, we start the forward vector at time k. And the dots here tell you I'm not saying how far forward we're going. So a key point here, horizons are not explicit in this arrow notation, they basically have to be implicit or, or stated what those horizons are elsewhere. So, what do we need to know? What are the degrees of freedom within the predictions? And how do you put these predictions into the performance index in an algebraic neat, and this is important, algebraically neat and transparent fashion, which makes the role of the degrees of freedom obvious. If we can see exactly how the degrees of freedom affect the predictions and therefore how they affect the performance index, then optimizing performance becomes straightforward. Now the predictions in the previous chapter were constructed assuming all, and this is important, all the future inputs could be selected. We just did a generic prediction structure. However, in practice, such a numeric computation would be intractable especially if you had very large horizons. So what do we do? It's necessary to select 
a subset of the future inputs and assume that the other values, the other future inputs, are known. And this gives you a more practical or pragmatic um, performance optimization. In practice, the way we do this is we assume that the input signal becomes fixed after n new steps. Now, that's not the only thing you can do, but certainly for historical algorithms like GPC, that was the assumption that was taken. And it's quite a reasonable assumption. So we're going to fix the input after n new steps. And that reduces our numbers of degrees of freedom to a practical number. So if you were going to use a Karima model in the associated predictions, you'll remember we had a pr prediction equation, something like this. If you've forgotten that, go and look at the chapter one videos. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that the future control increments, so this delta u future, you'll notice, what have we done? We've said I've got nu values that I can choose. And then after that, I'm going to assume that all the control increments are zero. So nu values can be selected to change the predictions. And after nu steps, the input increments are assumed to be zero. Now you are reminded that this, of course, is a prediction made at sample k. Obviously, when you get to sample k plus 1, you will update this assumption. So here, an illustration of what this prediction structure might look like. So the input increments is delta u. So I could, for example, say, well, I have a delta u here, a delta u here, a delta u here. And then, once we get to nu, the delta u's are 0. So once we get past a certain point, the delta u's are 0. So you'll see I had a delta u k, I had a delta u k plus 1 in this example, and a delta u k plus 2. So this one has got nu equals 3. I'm allowed 3 changes. Now, if I was to calculate the actual inputs, and I'll assume I started from 0, I would get a uk. I would get a uk plus 1. And then that one's negative. How negative is it? I would get a uk plus 2. And then after this point, it becomes constant. So you see I've got uk, uk plus 1, uk plus 2, and then you'll notice uk plus 2 plus i equals uk plus 2, because you've assumed the control increments are 0 in the future. So that's the sort of structure that's adopted in GPC. Now, if you were using a state space model and deviation variables, you'd have something very slightly different because the prediction equation is then of this form. And therefore, what you might do is you might say, OK, I'm going to assume the deviation variables. There you go. Now, in this case, there's something slightly subtle. I'm going to make that nu minus 1. So you've got particular values for the deviation variables for nu minus 1 samples. And then, in the long term, I assume that the deviation variables become fixed. So in other words, this US value is also a degree of freedom, so I've still got NU degrees of freedom. So we've got NU values, which can be selected to change the prediction. So NU different values for this deviation variable. And in the long term, we assume that the deviation becomes fixed. Now, for many algorithms, the, we assume that the deviation actually goes to zero in the long term, but we're not going to get into that subtlety yet. We're just giving a general structure here. So if I was to look at something like this, then I could say, for example, my input deviations, and that's the key thing, so we're talking about our input deviations, they could do something like this. We could go down here, and we could go up here. Uh, we could go down, and then we could have something like this. OK? So basically, the input deviations, which are these distances here, have a number of different values. But the key thing is, in the long term, it becomes fixed. We've got a fixed deviation. Now, if I was to plot the actual inputs, the interesting thing here is the deviation tells you how far you are relative to steady state. OK, so basically you're going to get the same 
the same structure. Now the steady state is equivalent to that line there. So you're going to get the same structure. You're going to get something like this. Oops, sorry, got to go all the way along to there. And so you'll see that this offset in here is the same as this offset in here. So deviation variables and inputs are just a shift of each other. OK, what about the performance index? The basic performance index includes a summation of terms which are rather messy to handle when you need to do an optimization. So what we want to do is make this look a bit simpler and so we can see the dependence on the degrees of freedom. Now, there exists a simple mathematical trick to turn a sum of squares into a single term, which is easy to handle. We're going to illustrate that here. So there was our performance index, j equals the sum of squares, e squared k plus i. And what I can do is I can actually write that as a row vector. There it is, a row vector of these errors multiplied by a column vector of these errors. But you'll remember that this column vector is e future k plus 1. And therefore, what I get is my performance index can be written as a vector transposed times a vector, which is a lot more compact and a lot easier to handle. If you had a multivariable system, each error term is a vector in itself. And you might think, oh, that's going to cause problems. But actually, it doesn't. You can use identical algebra, as we'll show here. So let's assume that it was multivariable. So you had a sum from i equals 1 to n of e transposed times e at the relevant samples. Now, you can calculate that by writing a row vector. Here it is e k plus 1 transposed, e k plus 2 transposed, up to e k plus n transposed, and multiplied by the corresponding column vector. And again, you'll see this is simply the e future k plus 1, and therefore you get the same performance index. So it's very nice if you use this trick, the CISO case and the MIMO case look the same. We take this e future vector, transpose it, and multiply it on itself, and that gives us the performance index we're interested in. So same formula for the CISO case. So key components. The video has summarized the key components for GPC in a compact fashion. First, we're going to assume that the input changes only over the first n new steps. And what that does is it gives you a specific structure for the prediction vectors, and in particular, a particular structure for these two vectors here. And these, remember, are your degrees of freedom. So we're giving a very specific structure to our degrees of freedom. And then what we're going to do is rewrite the performance index in terms of the vectors by removing the summing junction and using this vector notation. And so we have very compact performance index notation, which makes it, as you will see, easier to handle later on.